Good morning. I feel really honored and excited to come here and um, meet you guys and share um, some of my research about um, the relationship between exposure to nature and human health and well-being. So um, my name is Dongying Li. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Landscape Architecture and Urban Planning at Texas A&M University. Um, I got my degree from University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana. So I do feel at home here. Um, I like this weather and you know even the snow. Um, so today I will talk about um, nature deficit disorder, um, especially how nature is related to human health, especially children's health and development. Everyone here in this room probably knows about um, lost child in the woods. So Richard Louf, um, one of the most influential guys um, that called for action, called for attention to this issue of nature deficit disorder. And here he talks about nature calm people, focus people, and excite their senses. So those pretty much um, summarizes a lot of the aspect, the attentional restoration, the stress recovery, and the sensory aspects of nature. And um, in the discussion of nature deficit disorder, we often see um, this problem discussed as a technological problem. You know, because of the explosion of information, because we have computers, the internet, um, kids now don't spend time outdoors. Or even though, even if they spend time outdoors, um, they're still, you know, with their phones, with their iPads, and they're not really engaging this nature. And it's discussed as a fear of stranger issue. Um, you know, referring back to um, the death of doesn't life of great um, American cities. Um, people talk about how um, there are not as much eyes on the street. So we don't feel the sense of place, sense of neighborhood as we did before. To me, these are all valid changes in mindset that um, really explain why we have this issue of na nature deficit disorder. But to me, um, there's also something else. I also feel like it's a spatial, it's a physical environmental issue, it's a planning and design issue that our children are not exposed to nature anymore. This is a study done by um, US Forest Surf, um, USDA Forest Service, Service and um, they looked at 20 different cities in the United States um, over a three to six period, um, year period and looking at the change in tree cover in those cities. What they found is, as a nation, we lose four million trees per year. And on average, um, those cities see a decrease in urban tree cover at 0.3, almost 0.3% per year. And Correspondingly, the cities also see an increase in impervious surface at more than 0.3% per year. So that's pretty scary. Um, if we think about New York City, um, a city that's already pretty urban and built, um, they only have about 20% tree and shrub cover right now. If they go at this speed, then we will take, you know, it'll take less than 100 years or even less than 70 years for New York City to become like an all impervious cover city. Um, yesterday we had a tour in Cedar Rapids and it, um, it looks to me that Cedar Rapids is doing a lot of good things <coughs> about planting trees and maybe if they included Cedar Rapids in the 20 cities that they look at, um, the numbers will look better. <laughs> And um, so it's not only individuals, it's not only children who are suffering from nature deficit disorder. It's also our cities. 
I now um, see the rabbit um, suffered from a major flood in 2008. Um, in Houston, we also suffered from Hurricane Harvey um, in August 2017. And um, 50 inches of rain just poured on the street of Houston. And um, even now, um, more than a year from the event, we still you know, meet people who have been displaced because of the flood and people who are still staying in shelters. Looking back, people begin to realize that um, it's the issue of impervious surface of urban development. Between um, 1996 and 2010, those dark black areas are the new urban development, the new impervious surface developed in Houston. And you can see that um, these are in the upper watershed, upper stream to the bayous in Houston. So when flood comes, when there's a lot of rainfall, it's not necessarily that those local areas that got flooded, but the downstream really got the hit because of those um, development in the upper stream. And people say that should never have been built. A lot of those development should have stayed as natural preserves, natural areas. When we talk about impervious surface, um, we often talk about these um, issues related with it. For example, um, it doesn't catch water and release it slowly. So that there has the problem of increased runoff volume and speed. And then um, there's less groundwater recharge and um, more pollution and sedimentation issues. And if we look at the water cycle here, um, from the, um, the point when there's precipitation, pretty much every component, every step in this water cycle can be influenced by whether you have impervious surface or if you have tree cover here. And interestingly, recently I saw a research. Um, this is a research published in Nature just um, in the recent months. And it's doing a simulation of the storm water condition, you know, um, mostly pre precipitation condition during Harvey. What they did is they looked at this urban condition and they did a simulation replacing the urban cover with cropland in the same place. And they looked at whether doing this replacement changed the amount of precipitation that would fall on the surface. And comparing those two, you can see that um, with the cropland cover, you actually see a significant decreased amount of precipitation. So they found out that um, impervious surface actually increased total rainfall. And it caused the shift in the location of so here, um, this appears to be the place where you have maximum rainfall. But if you have crop cover, um, this location actually shifts. And they conclude that um, impervious surface <coughs> impact the amount of rain water and increase the chances of extreme flooding by 21 times. So going back to this, um, in the past we know that um, all of these processes are influenced by trees and natural cover. But now we also know that precipitation is also impacted by that. So it's not only the stormwater response, um, you know, what happens after the rainwater hits the surface, but it's also about how much rainwater that's going to hit. I see that um, Trees Forever has been making effort over the years um, in terms of saving individuals in our cities from nature deficit disorder. 
um, in recent years, there, in the research community, we also see a momentum in terms of you know, looking at the relationships between nature and human health. So um, today, um, my presentation is divided into three different parts. Um, the first part, I will give a, um, br uh, like a brief overview of the different benefits of nature on human health. And then the second part, um, I will focus on a few recent studies done by our group, um, me and my colleagues, looking at um, what nature brings for children and adolescents. And then um, the third part, we'll briefly look at valuation, like um, how we can really quantify the intangible benefits of nature. Okay, so for the first part, um, this is not an exhaustive list of the type of benefits that we can get from nature. Um, I will just briefly talk about um, recovery from mental fatigue, um, stress reduction, and emotional enhancement, um, and microclimate comfort. So um, we have pretty strong accumulated evidence showing that um, Exposure to nature, spending time in nature, help people recover from mental fatigue and help them restore their attentional capacity. And that has been um, demonstrated in residential settings, office settings, in schools, and then um, in walks in cities as well. For example, um, this Berman study from 2008. Um, so basically they recruited participants um, and then they assign them to t two different conditions, to either walk in downtown area in Ann Arbor or to walk in an arboretum. And then before and after the walk, um, they ask them to do um, some simple tests of attention. Um, this test is called digit span backwards. So basically, the researcher will say a sequence of numbers, like one, two, three, and then the participant has to repeat back the sequence of the number, one, two, three. That's um, digit span forward. And backward is, if I say one, two, three, the participants will um, repeat it back in um, reverse <coughs> sequence, like three, two, one. And um, the se number of sequence will go up until the participant make two consecutive fails. So this is the kind of environment for the urban walk. And on the right, the kind of environment for the arboretum walk. Um, and on the chart here, um, this is a group um, showing the before and after conditions um, for participants' performance on the digit backward test. And this is another um, group. So looking at this, do you feel like this is the downtown walk, this is the arboretum walk, or if this is the arboretum walk and this is the downtown? So which one is the downtown, the left one or the right one? The left one. So here, this is the downtown walk. Um, you can see a, like a slight change, but that change was not statistically significant. Um, instead, for the arboretum walk, you see a statistically significant increase almost by two digits um, in terms of performance on that test. The second aspect um, that we have really good evidence support for is um, reduced stress, anxiety, and depression. And um, research has showed all of those different kind of settings where when people have visual connection with nature or they have immersive experience in nature, they experience reduced stress, anxiety, and depression. This is a study um, by Bayer and colleagues um, from 2014. And they looked at population level, like whether um, those communities have um, tree cover and green space in, those, in the blocks, and how that might be related to their stress levels, um, anxiety levels, and depression. 
and this is their result. So they found out that um, a 25% more tree co cover is associated with less depression, less stress. A 25% higher NDVI, so this is a vegetation index. It represents um, the density of rep, um, vegetation. So 25% um, increase is associated with less depression and anxiety. And putting them together, a 25% more green space is associated with all of the three different variables. The third aspect, um, this is a pretty new area of research um, about how urban tree canopy cover um, actually enhances microclimate comfort and make people more willing to have physical activities outdoors. Um, this is gaining momentum because um, a lot of the you know, um, global warming projections are actually showing us we will have more extreme weathers and heat waves um, across the globe. So this is a study um, also just recently published looking at different areas, different regions in the United States and how those regions might be impacted by um, global warming in terms of um, heat stress. So here, um, I think we are kind of in between this um, Great Lakes region and the, um, this northern um, plains region. And they found out that by um, around 2035, about half of the extreme events, um, heat events, will be contributed by global warming. So this is a study looking at um, how microclimate comfort and people's preference in terms of you know, microclimate comfort shading actually plays into a part um, of how um, you know, their, their perceived well-being, how um, psychologically and physically comfortable they feel. So they did survey with residents in UK and Italy. And they surveyed their psychological, physical benefits um, and well-being during their visit to nature and after their visits. And they found out that um, the preference for shade actually is related to the, their psychological well-being. And um, there's pretty um, like consistent relationship between um, benefits related to short-term and long-term um, effects related to their visit to the nature. So um, these are just some overview of different areas and examples of studies in those areas um, that show us the relationship or the benefits of nature. And then I'm going to talk about um, three of our own studies looking at how nature could benefit children. Um, the first two studies looking at children's learning and um, academic performance. And then the third study looking at um, children who are on the autism spectrum. So this is what we call um, window view study. Um, I collaborated with Bill Sullivan on this. Um, and we were wondering that um, if having a view to a green space in classrooms helped students recover from mental fatigue and allow them to have better attentional capacities as they are engaged in academic tasks. So um, we recruited five different high schools in Illinois and um, a total of 90 something students. Each student um, did the experiment in their own schools. So basically we found three different kinds of classrooms in each of the schools. One classroom with a green window view, like a view onto like a space where you have trees, shrubs, and then a, um, a classroom with a window onto a barren space, like the facade of the building or a parking lot. And then the third condition is, a classroom with no window view at all. 
and we assign the student, randomly assign the students to the different conditions. And we ask them to um, take a baseline measure and then um, conduct some academic performance, you know, like activities that they would typically do in a classroom setting. And then um, we ask them to take a break, 10 minute break um, in the classroom that they are assigned to. And we measured their performance in terms of um, the same measures, digit span forward, digit span backward that we looked at just now. And this shows our result. So we took a measure of their attentional performance at the end of the tasks and then another time at the end of the break. Looking at this no window condition, after the break, their attentional performance even decreased a little bit, although this was not um, statistically significant. And this is the barren condition. Um, increased a little bit, again, not significant. What do you think um, the line is going to look like for the green condition? Steeper going up. Here. So we have a very significant increase in terms of students' attentional performance after the break in this green window view setting. Um, same with um, digit span backward. Um, some change, but not significant here. Um, similar here. And then significant change in the screen setting. We also um, used regression. So basically we're thinking that um, there might be individual differences, you know, confounding factors, other factors that could explain the differences. So we controlled those factors. For example, we controlled demographics, um, socioeconomics, um, chronic stress, and other um, conditions. And um, if we want to explain the variance in students' overall attention of functioning, demographics um, only explained 15% of it. Adding in um, some other factors, um, in total we could explain 18% of students' attentional functioning. But adding in the window, window view condition, we explained 30% um, of the total variation in students' attentional performance. And this is significant compared to the other models showing that um, window view is actually a very significant impacting factor for students' attentional performance. So after doing that first window view study, um, we were thinking that, okay, so that was just a, like a brief 10 minute visual connection with nature. Um, what about, you know, Students every day, you know, um, on their way to school, on their way home, you know, so much different exposure that happened in different settings for the students. And we wonder that, okay, so we looked at individual level attentional performance. So we did all of the experiment one-on-one. -on -one. What about looking at um, school-wide conditions, school-wide performance? Would we be able to see like higher school-wide performance um, if those schools are greener or the school surroundings are greener. So um, we took um, more than 600 um, different high schools in Illinois and looked at um, a buffer. Um, we looked at one mile, um, 0.5 mile, two mile, three mile buffer radius um, around those schools and calculated the tree cover percentage in those areas. And then um, we measured performance by some standard um, reports, um, ACT scores, um, college readiness, and freshman on track um, graduation rates. So th these are pretty standard um, performance indices of um, school level academic performance. And um, we found out that um, the different schools varied a significant amount in terms of 
um, what's the percentage of tree cover surrounding those schools. There are schools that have 0.5% um, tree cover surrounding those schools. And there are other schools that have um, you know, almost 30% tree cover. And um, our findings show that um, the test score is actually related to the percentage tree cover in those surroundings of the schools. So test, test score, um, ACT score, college readiness, and freshman on track are all significantly related. And um, speaking in terms of the magnitude, a 10% increase in tree cover is associated with a 0.2 point increase in average ACT score. That's the school-wide average ACT score. And 1.2% uh, more students who are ready for college. So these are um, pretty significant and important relationships that we found in terms of how um, the nature in school surroundings could be related to school level performance. Um, the third study we did um, looked at nature and children who are on the autism spectrum. We know that um, right now, um, one in 65 um, children in the United States have um, ASD, and it's the fastest growing developmental disorder in the United States, and also a lot of other areas in the world as well. Um, in some of the um, developing countries like China, um, people estimate it to be like one in a thousand, but then there are studies showing that um, there's largely widely underrepresentation and underdiagnosis in terms of this issue. So um, we also have a pretty like <coughs> severe issue in terms of autism. So our question here was, can nature help children with autism? And we are asking this question because we see a lot of good studies with children who have ADHD or ADD. And they have very significant findings showing that um, a walk in nature actually helped them reduce the symptoms of ADHD and ADD. So um, as another form of developmental disorder, um, we are wondering that if nature can help children with ASD as well. And if it does help, what are the barriers that children with ASD face in accessing nature and green space? Um, so in this study, we aim to um, develop a pre um, preliminary framework in terms of the different areas of benefits that children with ASD um, could get from spending time in nature. Um, and we did a semi-structured interview with parents and caregivers um, of children who have ASD. And we asked about the children's daily activities and whether nature is a part of their daily outdoor activity. And we asked about the benefits associated with those that can be identified by the caregivers. And what are the barriers and the concerns that caregivers have um, in terms of taking their children to nature. So um, we did um, 22 interviews um, with parents from two different cities in China um, based on our connection with um, autism centers in China. And then um, each interview took about an hour, more or less of an hour. Um, and we did coding and content analysis to look at those um, conversation transcripts. Um, in terms of the benefits, um, those are the main categories that we identified from those conversations. Um, sensory motor development, emotional development, and social development. As we don't have time to go into the details of each of those, I'll just give some examples. Um, for example, um, parents really talked about the loose parts 
how nature or natural areas provided loose parts for children to play with. And those loose parts really attracted and engaged their children. Um, they mentioned sand, mud, water, twigs, <coughs> and pebbles, and how children on the ASD spectrum really enjoyed playing with that. But there's also complexities and controversies associated with that. A lot of parents argued or wondered whether this kind of play is meaningful. And some parents made the comment that um, other children, typically developing children, would take the sand, load the sand in a toy cart or in a toy truck and move it somewhere else. Or they would build a castle out of the sand. But most of the children with ASD, um, they just grab a handful of sand and see it run through their fingers. So parents, although they recognized that children really engaged the loose parts, they wondered whether those are you know, symptoms, self-stimulation, or whether these are signs that um, their symptoms are getting worse when they play with sand, and wh whether they are actually getting the developmental benefits, whether they are growing by playing in that way. Um, a lot of parents also talked about happiness and hope and how the children became really energetic, um, how nature calmed them um, as they play outside. And they mentioned the social aspect um, related to proximity to other children, although they also recognized that not all children with ASD actually took the opportunity to engage other children. Actually, most of them needed some kind of intervention um, to actually approach the other kids, or they need the other kids to approach them for intervention, to, for interaction to happen. And a lot of them, um, they, they did um, you know, run after some other kids, or um, they began playing, but those play sessions didn't last long. And we look at um, the concerns and the barriers that parents identified in terms of taking their children to nature. Um, those included inappropriate behavior, um, safety concerns, phobia, and issues with the public realm. Um, a lot of the children with ASD can't understand the rules. So um, their behavior can be perceived as odd or inappropriate by some other people. Um, once they have a meltdown or tantrum, um, the parents really have a hard time, you know, because in a public space, open space, um, they feel like they have responsibilities in terms of, you know, regulating their children's behavior. And, um, it's just really hard for them to control or regulate the behavior and make sure the children don't hurt themselves or hurt someone else. Um, a lot of parents talked about how their children don't have a sense of danger and there's the traffic, um, stranger issue, and all of those safety concerns. And also, um, there's phobia um, triggered by some environmental um, stimuli, such as over and under um, stimulation. If there's a loud construction noise outside, if there's traffic noise, um, a lot of children with ASD would um, actually feel overstimulated. And you know, um, th that could be a trigger for meltdown or discomfort. And then um, parents worried about um, being judged or being excluded um, from the public space or from um, meaningful interaction. So um, summarizing all of the different categories that we found out, um, we um, developed this um, preliminary framework showing that um, 
there are different areas um, of benefits and areas of concerns that parents with children who have ASD um, have. And we are hoping to really dig down into those um, different aspects and see how we can have interventions in nature as a supportive um, environment um, to help people, um, ch children with ASD, or how we as planners and designers can design our public space so that we alleviate a lot of the barriers here. For example, um, those design strategies that we can consider are um, a good balance between openness and enclosure. Um, areas where parents can easily supervise their children, keep, a, keep an eye on them, um, preventing falling, providing loose parts, um, having fewer predefined functions, and make it more unstructured for children to play. And also, um, private hideout, um, managing light, color, texture, music, and so on. OK. So after talking about um, three of our own studies, um, I would like to discuss a little bit of the valuation part. Because a lot of the benefits of nature um, is seen as intangible. Um, how can we actually quantify or describe those benefits? So the easiest way would be the hedonic pricing model. So basically, um, it's a um, pricing model that recognizes that there are internal and external factors that goes into the pricing. And in terms of property value, there are a lot of studies showing that um, if you have um, vegetation and trees in the block or on the property, um, it's going to enhance the property value. Um, for example, um, this study here looks at an additional 10% tree cover, and they found out that um, if you have an additional 10% of mature trees, um, it ha has 1% increase in terms of the property value. Um, if you have a larger scale, 10% um, increase in mature trees, um, there's a 2.5% increase in property value. Um, of course, um, the, the results differ a lot in the different areas. And there has actually been studies that show non-significant results in terms of tree cover and property value. But more studies actually show significant results. Um, this is another study. Um, this is done in Los Angeles, um, looking at as green space area increase, how does the <coughs> price, um, property price, increase? And you can see that um, it's a positive relationship, especially in the area where you don't have a lot of green space. Um, another city. Uh, sorry, another study looking at five different cities um, in different states in the United States. And um, this actually included the property value as one of the um, valuation. But they also included some other aspects. For example, energy savings, um, carbon sequestration, air quality, stormwater runoff reductions. And they were able to quantify all of those different aspects in monetary terms. So on this chart here, um, everything that's above this red line would be a benefit. And everything that's below this red line would be a cost. So for example, the um, costs that they looked at includes um, you know, administration, infrastructure, um, maintenance, disposal, um, and those aspects. And then um, these are the five different aspects of benefits that we just talked about. And you can see that for most of the cities, you have more benefit than cost. Same for the others as well. 
in conclusion, um, they said that um, for each tree, they spent around 13 to 65 dollars annually, um, but they get a benefit, total benefit of about 31 um, dollar to 89 dollar. So that's a significant. Um, significant um, reward in terms of benefit of those trees. Um, this is a case study that um, some of my colleagues did um, for a master planned community in Houston. So this is a pretty new project. Um, the design was by um, SWA Group. It's a landscape architecture firm. Um, and then um, it has showed really great results. Um, it's ranked top 10 for new home sales in Houston, um, second highest percentage sale um, nationwide um, in a lot of years. And the design showed um, really like a, a great effort in preserving a lot of the open space and re restoring um, the prairie and um, irrigated um, the landscape with stormwater recycle, stormwater management practices. And um, this study looked at the site before and after this intervention, after the construction of this master planned community. Um, so they did this study by selecting a bunch of sites so these are their sampling locations. And for those sampling locations, they looked at water quality, um, soil quality, and different vegetation species and everything. And they did it after the construction of the master plan community as well. Um, so um, pretty detailed analysis in terms of how water pollution changed um, soil um, composition changed and everything. And they looked at cost savings um, by summarizing all of the different aspects. In conclusion, um, they found out that um, there is um, reduced water pollution by a great amount. <laughs> there's carbon sequestration and there's savings in maintenance cost um, and all those different aspects as well. So those are pretty big numbers um, in terms of um, the cost saving when we switch from a traditional kind of master plan community to a master plan community where low impact development is implemented. Um, so this is a EPA <coughs> stormwater calculator. <coughs> Um, this is what we use with a lot of our students, you know, when they do their design, we ask them to use this calculator to look at the performance, potential performance of their design. And as they're thinking about design alternatives, we ask them to use this to compare between the different designs and see what might be the strengths and weaknesses of those designs. And um, so basically, um, this is developed by EPA, and um, this platform actually um, consists of data sets related to local climate conditions, land cover, precipitation, soil conditions, and a lot of those um, built into this platform. And um, if you input um, for example, the total area of green infrastructure, total area of rain garden, rooftop garden, um, total area of bioswale, um, and some other key um, planning indices of your design, you will able to um, you will be able to calculate the stormwater um, performances as well as the costs over um, like a one year period, as well as the over the life cycle of this project. So um, we, we are having more and more tools um, at our disposal in terms of evaluating um, not only 
already develop, developed and built projects, but also projects that are in the planning and design phase as well. Um, in addition to those environmental benefits, we can also see that we are able to quantify some of the health and social benefits um, in you know, quantifiable terms as well. For example, um, this is a study looking at happiness and well-being. And they found that moving from a barren to a green neighborhood has the effect equivalent to one third of the effect of getting married. <laughs> or um, one tenth of the effect of um, getting from unemployed to employed. So this other study looks at um, people's perceived overall health and um, having 10 more trees in the block in this neighborhood has an effect equivalent to earning 10,000 more per year. Or um, being seven years younger <laughs> um, in terms of their um, cardio um, conditions um, it even has an e equivalent effect of 20,000 more income. Or moving to a neighborhood with um, 10,000 more median income. And in terms of ADHD treatment, um, when you take a child in, um, on a walk in a park versus downtown, the effect, difference in effect between this um, park walk and downtown walk is actually equivalent to the peak effect of the typical medications of ADHD. So looking at these, um, these are pretty significant results. Um, we probably don't know how how much more happier I'm gonna be um, if I move to a greener neighborhood. But I can see one third of um, getting married, that, that's a pretty good effect there. Um, so these are individual level effects. So um, if you think about it, um, you can give a person a $10,000 raise and um, this person will feel happier. So if you want another person to feel happier, you have to give him another $10,000 raise. You can't you know, split that money and make 10 people happy. Or you can't split a pill and um, you know, um, help m like more than one child um, relieve um, their symptoms. Just like here, um, if the girl decides to share her ice cream with her puppy, um, they will each get half of the ice cream. But as they decide to um, have this time, spend this time together in nature, they will both get the full effect of nature. The mental health effect, the attentional capacity effect, um, and the feeling good, the social capital effect, and everything. So nature as a shared amenity, um, if it's open to all, accessible to all, um, we are talking about multiplications of those effects on all of those people who can use the natural space, who can look at the trees, or who can get close to the trees, for the people, you know, for, for the young and the old, um, for the healthy and um, the in need, and for the rich and the poor. With that, thank you very much. Questions, but Dr. Lee will be Dr. Lee will be around. 
picture. There it goes. Anyway, Dr. Lee will be around, but we have time for a few questions. I know there was that was a lot to uh, take in. You covered a huge amount of ground there. Everything from autism to just the percentages that we're losing every year. Dennis back there? I have a question. Did you think about are there cultural differences in terms of our perception of benefits of uh, green space? Right. Um, we didn't do any study on um, cultural differences, but that's a good point. Um, th there, there are um, proposals to look at, you know, um, cross culturally that, um, you know, how people perceive, you know, green space differently, and how that perception might actually change the benefits that they get. Um, there actually has been studies done in Singapore showing that um, people in Singapore perceive urban nature differently than people in the United States, yeah. Right, um, so for the autism study, we really want to um, <coughs> dig deep because um, ASD is such a wide spectrum and you know, based on where each kid sits on that spectrum, um, he has really different you know, symptoms, um, different needs, and different you know, perceptions. So um, we're really hoping to be able to look at um, you know, kids who are on the different location of that spectrum, and also in terms of the different benefits, you know, um, sensory motor benefits, um, emotional benefits, and really be able to like isolate um, some of the group and look in detail at you know how we can do interventions like a walk in nature or um, other kind of programs that could help those children. We can. I don't think we have copies here. Did, did you bring any um, of your presentation? There's a copy on that. I can send you a copy too. We will. Okay, we will have the, this available on our website as far as the presentation. Thanks to Robin back there filming for us. Yeah, I'd like to add maybe uh, before you go into the greener neighborhood or the greener school, what there might be personal assets, family assets, family background that they're already back to some of the staff before the kind of quality to tell us they have to get most out of that. So does that make sense that background that comes into those situations, they don't really have some of those qualities that can say that. Right. Um, so um, in this kind of research, um, there, there's always that um, self-selection effect. You know, um, for example, people who are wealthier or um, who have a um, background that's more like closely related to nature might be more likely to move to a, like a greener neighborhood. Um, or people who love nature will just move and then they will feel happier. Um, that's um, always a confounding effect in this um, kind of research. Um, some of the papers we talked about um, controlled for a lot of the socioeconomic conditions. Um, but um, you are definitely right. That's a factor that we have to consider. One more bit of you. Those are excellent questions. Um, so 
um, in, in terms of um, the elderly, um, there are actually a, a, like a strong cluster of research looking at um, exposure to nature for the elderly, you know, um, people who have Alzheimer's or, um, you know, just the general public. Um, we have a recent study looking at um, how older people's um, choice of um, activity space in the parks differ, um, you know, we, we were identifying different subtypes of subgroups of um, elderly who are willing to do activities in the different areas of the parks and how that actually influenced their, you know, um, stress recovery kind of effects um, after the visit. And then um, about your other question, um, the temporal effect of um, exposure to nature. Um, there has been some studies looking at um, whether that effect can last over time or whether it, you know, it bumps up and down. Um, that's definitely another area that needs more research. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Thank, Thank you so much. much.